Hello and welcome to the afternoon session of the House Education Committee of the Vermont House of Representatives on January 15th. And we are delighted to hear today from Mary Lundeen, who's president and chair of the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators. Um, Tracy, for, the, for those who uh, were here last year, retired. So I thought, uh, Mary, I would just let us all introduce ourselves. Um, so you'll know who we are as well. Uh, Kate Webb from Shelburne, I'm a retired special educator and chair of the committee. Um, I'm just gonna go around, uh, Representative Coopley. Yeah, Representative Larry Coopley from Rotland City, vice chair. Um, Representative Conlon is our, our ranking member. Hi, I'm Peter Conlon from Cornwall, just outside Middlebury. Um, I'm the ranking member and I've had my camera off. Uh, you'll just excuse me, I'm eating some lunch and you don't wanna watch that. <laughs> uh, Representative James. Yeah, I'm uh, Kathleen James from Manchester and my district is Bennington 4, which is Arlington, Manchester, Sandgate, and most of Sunday. And Representative 2? Uh, Representative 2, I represent Franklin 3-1, which is St. Albans City <clears throat> and St. Albans Town. And Representative Hooper. Hi, Mary. I'm Jay Hooper. I represent the five towns of Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury. And then we have four new members that are joining us this year. So we have not actually met in person. We've only met on screen. So we're going along here. Um, Representative Brown. Oh, good afternoon. I'm Representative Jana Brown representing the town of Richmond. And Representative Arison. Representative Arison, uh, Weathersfield, Cavendish. And Representative Williams. Hi, I'm Terry Williams. I live in Granby. I represent West Caledonia, which includes Concord, Victory, Granby, Guildhall, Maidstone, Lunenburg, Brunswick, and Kirby. <laughs> Someday I will remember those without looking. <laughs> Good for you. And we're missing Representative Erin Brady. She is a teacher. Uh, she, she is finishing up uh, this semester and then she'll be joining us full time. So she, she signs in when she can and otherwise watches our, our work on, on YouTube. So welcome, Mary Lundeen. Can you introduce yourself and give us your testimony? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm happy to be here representing the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators. I am the president of that organization. I am also the director of special services for the Mount Mansfield Unified Union School District, which serves Richmond, Jericho, Underhill, Bolton, and Huntington. Um, and I just began that job July 1st in the middle of a pandemic. So um, I am in my 18th year serving as an administrator in the state of Vermont. I have been a superintendent, but most of my administrative career has been as a special ed director. And I met with this um, committee last year when I was in the Montpelier Roxbury School District. So I remember some of your faces and it's nice to see you all again. And thank you for your service. So I sent um, a document last night and what that document was, was identifying the priorities that BCSEA has this year for the legislative session. And so our um, focus really is on the COVID-19 impact on students with disabilities. The second one is on MTSS implementation to support Act 173. The third is to maximize interagency collaboration to improve access to mental health supports for children and families. And then the fourth is on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as um, Chair Webb said in her opening remarks, Tracy Sawyers was the executive director for the Vermont Council of Special Edu Education Administrators. She um, did leave our organization for another position. So for the remainder of the school year, it will be me and Megan Roy, who is the chair of the 173 advisory board, 
who are available to support you in any of the work um, where you're looking for testimony. So we are happy to do that. And if we aren't available, we will find another VCSEA board member to participate. So um, I'm gonna just try to go through quickly the four areas that I identified. And then if you have any questions or anything that you're thinking about, I'm happy to answer questions. So as we all know, COVID-19 has had um, huge implications for everything, um, for our economy, certainly for education. It's unprecedented and we had to turn on a dime quickly last March to figure out how we were going to educate students. It was challenging enough thinking about that for general education, but when you think about children with disabilities, there was nothing in the federal law to guide our work. And so we really were flying the plane while we were building it. And we did the very best that we could to ensure that children received a free appropriate public education. So what we are focused on now is looking at how will we be able to determine the loss of skills now that we are back and we have some data to look at what's happening? So the spring for most of our schools is going to be looking at how much of a regression occurred and how do we support students to make up for some of the learning loss. I also wanna say it's not just specific to students with disabilities, all kids lost learning. And that is clear, very, very clear as we came back in the fall. Um, routines were lost, um, kids feeling safe. So there was more than just academic loss. And, and I think it's important for people to realize that. So um, the other piece that has come out of the pandemic is the issue of truancy. And that has been challenging because for families that have chosen to participate remotely, it, it's hard to know, is it that they don't have the Wi-Fi or they don't have the technology or is it that they are disengaged with all of the other factors that may be impacting their families. So that is a concern for all of us. And um, we believe we're really gonna have to maybe revisit the definition of truancy. Um, the other thing that we are noticing is that the numbers in special education are increasing. And what's happening is during the pandemic, there were families that had private evaluations done outside of the school district. And, and sometimes when that happens, the independent um, evaluator is not applying the special ed rules and regs the same way the school district would. And a big part of that is the, the rules and regs require us to look at um, was good first instruction provided. And so when you think about the pandemic, it, it really wasn't. And so that is just something that, that we are all noticing um, because children did not get the same level of instruction that they would have if we had been in school. So, the, so we are seeing a tick a, a, an uptick in numbers. Um, and then the other piece that is pretty significant is um, the number of children who are also presenting with anxiety and depression. And so that means that we need to do some more partnering with our mental health agencies around this. So, um, that was the first 
priority for us. The next one was around MTSS and the implementation of MTSS to, port, to support Act 173. So um, it's also clear in the state of Vermont that schools are at different places when you think about developing an MTSS framework and also implementing it. Some schools are, are almost there and other schools have not begun the work. And so when we think about Act 173 being successful, it's critical that every school in Vermont have a robust MTSS system, which means this work really needs to start to move ahead through general education. And that hasn't happened. It's been more special education trying to move the work forward. And so for those of you who are new, um, the whole idea of MTSS is that- Multi-tiered system of support. Yeah. Multi-tiered system of support is that you are going to provide good first instruction by a classroom teacher to every single child in your classroom. So it's a mind shift and people have to think about children with disabilities are general education students first. So that is a guiding principle in the federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So this is different when we think about teachers and it's not that teachers don't wanna do it, it's that undergrad programs don't prepare general educators to know how to teach children with learning challenges. And so what VCSEA is really advocating for is that the agency provide money and training for all teachers to understand how to work with children with disabilities. So um, I think this is gonna be a big conversation this year and we would very much like to be part of it. Um, so please reach out. Um, and then we will, be, we will be looking at um, the DMG report next week. Okay. Uh, if, if we can get Nate Levinson in, uh, we great. will be, we'll be pulling that up. Okay, great. Um, so the, the third one was what I hit on when I was talking about the pandemic. So we really want to maximize interagency collaboration with our mental heart, excuse me, our mental health partners to really look at how can we build capacity within our schools. So um, that is important work, especially as we have noticed pre-pandemic that the numbers of children with emotional disabilities was increasing now that we are in a pandemic and when we come out of it, we expect that those numbers are gonna to continue to grow significantly. So um, that is definitely a big focus for us. And then the fourth one was the diversity, equity and inclusion work. And that is a focus for all of our state organizations, the superintendents association, the principals association, school boards, business managers and curriculum directors along with the Vermont Council of Special Ed Administrators. So we are um, providing trainings in our schools around implicit bias and systemic racism and thinking about curriculum. But it also means thinking about some of our marginalized groups. So it's more than race. And so we, VCSEA, are making sure that some of those other groups are also um, a focus as we dig into this work. Um, so those were um, the four priorities we had. The other thing that I just wanted to mention today was the waiting study. And I know that that's also a big agenda item that you have this legislative session. And VCSEA would very much like to be involved in those conversations because we want to make sure that students are counted accurately um, and appropriately. And we also have some concerns around the formula 
and, and how the formula was created and wonderings about was the federal money that schools receive part of that formula because some school districts are definitely going to feel the impact when we switch over to the census-based model. So the school districts that don't have high numbers of children in poverty, and my district is one of those districts, the taxes in this district will increase significantly. So it's an important conversation as we move forward with this work. So I am happy to answer any questions that you have. And if I don't have the answer, I will get it and uh, send it back to Chair Webb. Thank you. I realized that I neglected to introduce a couple of people that are in this room. One is Representative Sarita Austin, who was here last year. So Sarita. Hi. Thank you. I'm, I'm Sarita Austin, a former educator and school board member. Um, and I'm from Colchester 9-2. And I just put in the chat that I would really appreciate your contact um, information just so I could speak to you about a uh, bill on drafting, not drafting, kind of revising a little bit. Great. Should I put it in the chat or should I just? I think you could put I... it in the chat. OK. That'd be great. Thank you. And um, Representative Aaron Brady just joined us. Um, Williston, right? Yes, hi, uh, I'm Representative Brady representing Williston and I am uh, an active school teacher. In fact, was just buzzing home in at the end of my day um, before this hearing. So um, appreciate your time and share many of your uh, priorities and passions. <laughs> and and Jesse Tracy, who's joining us this year, who's helping to pull our schedules together. <laughs> Uh, Jesse Tracy, the committee assistant for house education this year. Um, I'm looking for, uh, let me just get to questions that are here. I, ha I have one question myself in reference to the increase in numbers of children that you believe are being considered um, eligible for special education. Does this have to do with our question of, of adverse effect? Um, which adverse effect is the thing that basically looks to see if there's a discrepancy. And um, discrepancy can be because of a disability, but it could also be because of lack of instruction. Mm -hmm. um, so it, is that one of the things that could be in play here that it's gonna be easier to show that you're, you have a discrepancy because you, you haven't had, if no one's taught you to read. <laughs> Yes, so, so that is a big piece of it. So for example, if a child has qualified under the category of a specific learning disability, let's say in reading, um, based on some standardized test, that's how the outside evaluator would determine that. That report then comes to the school district to consider. And the school district then will look at adverse effect, which is gate two where you're gathering all the data and determining whether or not there's need. So it's been tricky because again, there's no guidance coming from the federal government around how to apply IDEA during the pandemic. And it's also hard for teachers who have never had to, to figure this stuff out. And so I think what has happened is um, people have looked at maybe where kids were in March and maybe where they were coming back in September and just try to use those few pieces. But when you really think about it, that's not enough information to really determine or tease out, was it lack of instruction or is it truly a disability? And families, um, sometimes are, you know, they're thinking, no, it's truly a disability. And, and so it's very, very tricky. But I think when I think about adverse effect and when VCSEA thinks about adverse effect, for those of us who have been around for a while, we remember the days before we had the clear criteria that exist in the rules now. And it, it felt like the Wild West 
for kids qualifying for special education. And then Vermont created this criteria, which basically provided schools with guiding questions and a way to collect data and analyze it and determine need, determine is the disability impacting. And if it's applied correctly, it works. And I think it's more what's happening is it's um, not being implemented correctly in some places and, um, and therefore people feel that kids are falling through the cracks. So it's really, it's a, it remains a training issue. Thank you. Other questions, uh, Representative Conlon and then Representative Austin. Uh, thank you very much um, for your testimony. Uh, one of the things that my ears perked up at is uh, the issue of students with emotional disabilities or emotional disturbance and the expectation that when school returns in September that those numbers are going to go up. Um, and that was a category that was identified in the study that led to 173 as potentially being over-identified already in Vermont because of our high numbers. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what my question is, but I guess it, uh, it, it, my comment would be, it seems we're, we're going to be going in the wrong direction there. Um, I'm a, the, the, not surprisingly, given the pandemic, um, and I guess I would like to hear your thoughts about that a little bit, and maybe also a, a bit about um, your colleagues across the country or in other states and, and sort of how they're gearing up to address that as well. Sure, thanks. Um, so I, I think one of the things that, that is really, really important for us to be thinking about when, when children are presenting with anxiety and depression, it's because of, of everything that's going on. And some of the things that need to happen are to focus on some of the executive function skills teaching kids that, but also really having more universal um, PBIS, positive behavior intervention supports, like designing those kind of systems, which is part of the MTSS. So the multi-tiered systems of support is not just specific to the academic areas. It, a big piece of that is social emotional learning. And it's important that we're addressing both because that's the piece that's missing that, that we believe is leading to this over-identification in emotional disturbance because kids are dysregulated um, and the, there hasn't been explicit instruction in some of these executive function skills that you need to be a student. And um, so I know the agency is really taking a look at some of the social emotional learning pieces, especially in response to COVID and um, that they are developing a plan to help schools think about how, do you, how are we going to address some of these things as we finish this school year, but then move into next school year. As far as um, my colleagues, across the country and um, emotional disabilities. I, I think it really depends on the state. I also think it's, um, you know, what are those supports that they have, those universal supports in schools? And that's really what makes the difference. Um, and, and that's why it's so important for us to keep going back and talking about there need to be changes in general education. That's what 173 was supposed to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to be looking at both parts of that. Um, one was, was the DMG, which talks about um, tier one instruction, general, general you know, addressing the needs of all students through MTSS. So we, we uh, will be bringing that back in and seeing if there's a way we can tie it into the current challenges we're having with, with children being out of school for so, such a long period of time. 
Um, other questions? Sarita Austin, Representative Austin. Thank you. Um, I'm a little concerned about uh, the increase in special ed um, the population in terms of parent. I feel like it might be an issue of equity and access because parents that can afford, you know, to have an independent report done, um, you know, there, there's very savvy parents out there um, that, you know, would like to see, probably do see their child maybe falling behind um, in academic skills, but may not be due to an, a disability, but now they're looking for access to SPED services because of this independent evaluators reports and some schools might honor that and other schools won't and you know I feel like uh, parents who couldn't afford uh, an independent evaluation or aren't as savvy you know their children might not have the same access. Mm -hmm. When I think about special education I think about it being necessary because you are missing a critical skill. And I think what happens is a lot of people, because we don't have the robust MTS systems within our schools, people think the only way to get supports is through special education. And so what, and that's why I keep going back to MTSS. That's why it is so important for us to shift the focus and say, we need to build this robust MTSS. This is general education and children should not need to be on an IEP to get the supports that they need. So that's the work. And if we had the resources and the supports in general education, people would not be looking to special education for, for somebody who might just be a little bit behind. Because sometimes all it takes is working with an interventionist for six mm -hmm. months to a year to give you that little bump that you might need. But mm -hmm. instead, students are referred to special education because general educators don't know how mm -hmm. to provide the scaffolds that kids need. And, and again, we're kind of going back to the whole spirit of 173, but, but it all starts with tier one. Mary, do you have um, any data on uh, the amount of professional development that different school districts have had in terms of MTSS? I don't have that data. I know what I've done. Um, when I was in Montpelier Roxbury, we did a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think what's happening is depending on the school, some haven't started and others are really far along. And it's, it, uh, again, it's, it, it's starting with superintendents and central office administrators really making that a priority and um, allocating professional development money for that training. And I think the training that, that I did last year is expensive. And so I think for some school districts, that is the obstacle. And that's why one of the things that BCSEA is advocating for is that the agency allocate money to schools so that everybody is on, everybody's on a level playing field and everyone is doing the same sort of professional development that is going to ensure that we have robust MTSS. Bill, we were working on last year that Representative Austin is going to, to uh, reintroduce with some COVID related updates. Um, we were actually looking at professional development provided more regionally. Um, it, it certainly, you have to have leadership to maintain something. I mean, we all know it's great. Everybody goes to a really cool groovy workshop and then everybody goes home and those teachers retire and whatever you were doing is gone. So there's uh, looking at sort of a sense of regional leadership that's probably broader than just a supervisory union, supervisory district. Mm -hmm. 
um, or um, at the agency level. And that would, that would require some personnel because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. that would, and that will be a part of the discussion as well, is trying to beef up the agency that yes. was really stripped in 2007 before I arrived. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Representative Austin, is, is that your hand from before? Or did you have, no, you're all set. Any other um, questions or thought? Mary, we're gonna really uh, wanna keep you involved in this way. Next week, we are looking at, we are hoping to look at DMG. We'll have Megan Roy come in as well and give us an update on the work that you've been doing with the 173 work group. Uh, you know that we have the waiting study, trying to look at that maybe as a way of a con conversation about equity that's beyond tax equity, um, but how we're actually making sure that, that students in poverty are receiving the the resources that they need. Um, Great. Yes, please um, reach out to VCSEA. Um, Megan, as you said, Megan Roy will be coming in. I'm happy to come back. Um, and we're looking forward to this session. Thank you. We have uh, some folks coming in now who um, are uh, school counselors. And we might actually do something in our committee, which is called Start Early. <laughs> um, this, will, this will be an unusual thing for us, but we're gonna give it a try anyway, uh, since we are recorded. Um, so you're welcome to stay. You're welcome to stay with us if you'd like, Mary. Um, oops, she's gone. <laughs> so um, let's see. I would like to start. Phyllis, you've just arrived. Um, Phyllis is Phyllis uh, Curio is the advisory chair of the Vermont School Counselors Association and has brought in some counselors for us. We've been hearing a bit about mental health as I'm sure you're not surprised. So we are very anxious to hear from you. And we, you know, we, we've started with the Maasai question of how are the children? And the answer is supposed to be the children are well. And I'm pretty sure that's might not be what you're reporting today. So welcome, Phyllis. If you could um, give us a start, we'd appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Representative Webb and all of the committee members. I really do appreciate your time and your support around the wellness of our students, our staff, and our communities. Um, we have been asked to testify today in regards to our students. And we, how we did it is we broke it up into five categories through our curriculum that we find imperative for our students to be successful. So we would like to discuss the mental health and mental well-being around their academics, their social emotional learning, their post-secondary planning, and what their needs can be for the future. Um, the, as I'm sure in every situation, um, we're not all in the same boat, but we are experiencing many different feelings for our staff in our schools and our students in our schools. Um, so I'm gonna primarily be speaking about my microcosm of a world in my region, but we did survey over 40 school counselors throughout the whole state. And we would like to generate a document that we can share with you at a future date with Thank how you. the other schools and students are doing. That would be um, most so appreciated. Thank you. Um, so right now, what I can say for me is that my students have an increase of anxiety, depression, disconnect, hopelessness, um, fear for what tomorrow will bring. Um, they're very disconnected with how their future should look because they everything they're used to, the college preparedness, um, the, the visits of local businesses for careers and career cafes and things that they're used to our schools doing that has all been put on hold right now. So speaking for myself, I typically have a curriculum grades seven through 12, where I meet with my students to discuss their future and their interests and their assessments around what they would like to do grow as they grow up. Um, we visit, we have field trips to college campuses. We have local businesses come into our school and discuss what careers look like for the future. And we really dive deep into how they can be successful in their future. Um, with COVID and their, their lack of being able to reach out and meet with people, that feeling of isolation has really increased. And with that, I get a lot of, I don't, why do I have to bother Ms. Correa? Why should I bother preparing? 
Um, am I even going to be able to go to campus next semester? Um, my parents don't have any money anymore. We don't have, you know, we're, we're worried about food right now. I can't worry about a college application. So I myself and along with my community here at Proctor and the Rutland region, we're really trying hard to bring a lot of virtual connection to our students. And for the most part, that has been a great supplement. I have had many admission counselors speak with my students virtually. I've had local businesses speak to our kids um, about a about, we've done a whole like career week in November and a gear up week in November. And that has gotten the kids more motivated. And I've seen an increase in, in participation with the virtual learning. So that is definitely a positive. Um, we feel very lucky that we have the technology we have. We are a one-to-one -one school with Chromebooks. Um, we have great Wi-Fi. We have some money. Um, so for us here in the um, Rutland Central Supervisory Union, we're doing okay that way. Um, but then for the kids who aren't engaging virtually, they're not engaging virtually anywhere. So I don't get to see them. I don't get to counsel them. Um, when I try to refer students out for mental health supports, there isn't enough in our community. So students are on a six to eight week waiting list. Um, so those kids that aren't engaging, that's only getting worse. And, so, and for some of my students, the ones that are engaging, their feelings of positivity are growing. So I see it being a positive thing, but the inequity between the kids who are coming to school and the kids who chose remote learning is vast for us. Um, there has been an uptick in suicide assessments for our local area in all the schools that I work within. So, um, so there is a, it's, there's a concern. Um, we, one of my big concerns is the post-traumatic stress that they will feel next year. Um, as things are getting a little bit worse for us right now, the, the trauma is increasing and I don't know what next year will look like. It's challenging that we lack, where we lack in mental resources, we might be good in another area like technology, but um, not having it all has, has hurt in a lot of areas. So my fear is for the future of our students' well-being and our staff. Our staff is really under the gun, under pressure, and um, they're almost, they need just as much mental health as we all do at this current, current moment. Um, and it's not just COVID, it's all the other things going on in the United States as well. Trying to engage with my students about the hate that's out there and the trauma that's out there, um, that's been a challenge. And it's just, it's like, a, it's like the perfect storm right now. So we're hoping with your support, we can, you know, we can get our voices heard a little bit more. We can get the resources we need. Um, and I'm not just talking monetary, monetary resources, just, you know, switching some things around might in itself help, but we need, we need to have that happen and we'll need um, our bosses to help that happen. So. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> What I'm going to do is just go down the list and then I'll open up the room for, for questions. And thank you very much, Phyllis. That was a, a good, good beginning. Um, Patrick Tomashat uh, from Lamoille South Supervisory Union. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm actually Patty. Oh, oh Patricia. Patricia. Yes. <laughs> Quite yes. all right. <laughs> um, I'm, um, uh, uh, Representative Webb, I was actually going to go last uh, as, okay. as part of a summary, so I think there's someone um, that okay, was going to go right after Phyllis. Thank you, though. Oh, yeah. Hi, I Suzanne. think I'm next on the list. Okay, me. great. Suzanne, welcome. Hi. Nice to see you all. Thank you for having us. My name is Suzanne Frankie, and I'm the elementary school counselor here at Union Elementary in Montpelier, the Montpelier-Roxbury School District. And I'm going to share with you some information about our social emotional status of our students. And this is, some of this is information that was shared by students, by school counselors across the state as Phyllis shared. Um, and some of it may be repetitive, but I think it's important to reinforce that, that many counselors across the state have, have shared that their students are experiencing 
these types of things. So isolation, missing social connections, loneliness, hopelessness, feeling disconnected, feeling conflicted about the future. Many students are disengaged. Many uh, schools have had a decline in attendance and I would even say in an engagement, active engagement with their, their teachers. A lack of trust with, the, with adults because they're not seeing people in person in a lot of, in a lot of districts. Uh, motivation, food insecurity, housing insecurity, a need to care for younger siblings when, when schools are virtual so parents can work, increased suicidal ideation, inadequate access to mental health providers, both in, in um, having enough mental health providers and also where they might be located and having access depending on where a student lives. Uh, missed days due to quarantining, disparity between socioeconomic groups and resources for technology and access and support, inconsistency in routines and schedule due to closures, remote versus in-person learning depending on the district, and decreased or no contact, oh, I, I, I already mentioned the trusted adults, and then challenges with anxiety, depression, attendance, self-harming behaviors, and work completion. So in our district in Montpelier Roxbury, uh, we conducted a screener called the SSRS, the Student Risk Screening, Student Screening Risk Survey. And we conducted that in November and found that 25% of our students were found to be at high or moderate risk for externalizing behaviors. And our Roxbury Elementary, Roxbury Village School found that they had 77% of their students at high or moderate risk for externalizing behaviors, which could be things such as defiance, inattention, or lashing out at others. And then we had 43% at our school and 46% at Roxbury of our students that were demonstrating internalizing behaviors, which are things like depression, anxiety, social isolation, loneliness, difficulty concentrating, and negative self-talk. And we, we conducted the same screener in the spring when we were remote and both areas of, of internalizing and externalizing behaviors increased greatly since the pandemic began. The student risk screening scale is an evidence-based screening tool used by schools across the country to identify students who are demonstrating signs of internalizing and externalizing behavior patterns. It's not a tool that's used to diagnose or assess students, but it allows us to identify students who may need support so that they don't fall through the cracks and also to help staff understand the scope of a problem so that we can move away from random acts of intervention, which are usually ineffective, and plan positive school-wide and group support experiences. Here at Union and Roxbury and the rest of our district, our schools are currently in person and we here at Union, we use a pod model uh, with at least two adults assigned to each classroom. We have also offered families a virtual op option and nine students attending our virtual academy are on intensive support plans focused on motivation, engagement, and anxiety. Our in-person students are exhibiting few behavior challenges, which may be related to less transition, contact with a smaller number of peers, consistent adult supervision and instruction in the classroom. Even so, internalizing behaviors are having a detrimental effect on our students. Our district is utilizing a K-12 social emotional learning, a set of learning standards. We're developing curriculum to address the these standards and providing support through mindfulness practices, mindful activities, yoga, and other supports. We're also uh, providing classroom-based and individual support to students through weekly virtual social emotional lessons and tools and resources shared with staff and caregivers. On a more positive note, many students our school counselors across the state reported that many students are happy to be in school, even if it's just a few days a week, 
thankful to be with peers, even virtually. F many students feel supported. Many are learning about technology and many are experiencing consistency when, especially when schools have remained in person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and next, and what I'm gonna do, we'll open it up to questions to everybody at, at the end. Um, next is Rai Hoffman. Welcome. Yes. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Rai Hoffman. I'm the head of the school counseling department at uh, Spalding High School in Barrie, Vermont. Um, and I'd uh, first like to thank the House Education Committee and Representative Webb um, for inviting school counselors to speak on behalf of the needs of students during this time. Um, it truly is appreciated. So I've been asked to speak about the academic impact these last two semesters have had on our students across the state and have collected data from more than 40 school counselors from different districts to share with this committee. My intention is to speak to the mental health impact current academic protocols and learning expectations are having on school age children. I ask this committee to please put yourself in the shoes of students when hearing the challenges students are facing currently during this time. Many students are behind in their learning, are feeling as though they need to teach themselves and are simply performing tasks and truly not learning content and standards. There's less engagement with teachers and learning in a collective group and thus less engagement with content. There are many, many students who are struggling with executive functioning skills, such as organization, and these struggles are exacerbated by remote and independent learning. Students commonly speak to feeling distracted, confused with remote learning, and frustrated with a general lack of progress and enjoyment, which sadly results in a number of students giving up and not remaining engaged. In an effort to speak to specific statistics, I would like to share some data from my school, Spalding High School, to this effect. At Spalding High School, we have two weeks left to our current semester, and most of our courses are semester-long classes. In comparing this year to last year, at this time, nearly three times as many classes will be failed this semester by our students. Most of these courses, such as English, Math, History, and Science, are core courses which need to be retaken. The social, emotional, and psychological impact of retaking a class is significant, and one which can lead to further disengagement from education and potentially increased dropout rates. In fact, the number of students who have chosen to discontinue their schooling this year, as compared to last year at this time at my school, has tripled. At the high school level, some students are working for employers during the day so as to provide for their families, making education even less engaging and more independent. Since last spring, there are more seniors considering not continuing their education beyond high school due to the frustration with online learning and the lack of a true college experience. So in summation, the impact on academics during this time is significant and has been felt from elementary through high schools and are bound to have lasting effects for years to come on education for Vermont students. School counselors and educators as a whole are fearful what the, that impact will be and how in our current system, we will be able to rebound for the sake of our students. We long for normalcy, as do all people, but our hearts are with our students whose academic success and progress is regularly tied to their social and emotional well being. And given that academic success for many students has been slowed and sometimes halted, the perception is that student psychological need during this time is at an all time high. I want to thank you again for your time, and we'll take questions at the end. Thank you, uh, Rai. Appreciate this. And um, next is, let me just check, oh, Lisa LaPlante. And I hear that you have you're going to tell us some positive things. <laughs> I am. I get to be the positive one, lucky me. So good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. I'm grateful to be afforded this opportunity to share some of the positives that school counselors are experiencing. Since last March, the meaning of the word positive has changed for many. Prior to March 2020, the definition of positive was accepted as being good, constructive, and optimistic. Since COVID, the word positive now instills feelings of worry, fear, and hopefully empathy. As I testify, I want to bring your attention to the meaning of the word positive prior to COVID-19. As difficult as the last 10 months have been, there have been many positives, old definition, that have come from this pandemic, and I'm excited to share the feedback that we receive from counselors across the state. I actually got a little creative and created a wordle from the feedback and the words that stood out were students, learning, school, 
remote meetings, families, parents, options, time, increased technology, relationships, platforms, supports, skills, discussions, pathways, education, success online, deliver, individual, hope, emotional, access, and focus. In looking at the feedback, there were some themes that emerged. The first one was the increased flexibility. Some students are finding success in online learning and hope to be able to continue learning this way. There's been more diverse learning pathways with different options for education, like in-person, hybrid, fully remote, and we're hopeful we can keep some of these options for students going forward. Some schools, there's been recess for older students and extended lunch periods. There are remote and virtual days, and these offer times in the school day for counselors to meet with their students and families for tier one curriculum, which Phyllis was talking about, and individual supports. Self-starting teenagers have freedom to work outside the school walls. Districts have created virtual learning academies. Snow days have become remote days. Open campuses for older students have been great and fully online learning has been positive for some students. The next theme was an increase of technology platforms uh, and increased skill with technology. So we have students now with one-on-one -on -one access to computers and iPads. We have students reading all the time when they're remote and students are increasing their computer skills exponentially. And in the social and emotional realm, the state of, of Vermont and the Agency of Education has now really focused on social emotional learning and the mental health of our students. So thank you so much. Students learning how to reach out and communicate in new ways. Students are learning how to self-regulate. Um, the use of circles and discussions around resilience, kindness, hope, adversity, and how to get through difficult situations has increased. Counselors are finding innovative ways to provide lessons for students in social emotional learning and creative solutions to find ways to, to help students meet their needs. We've had fewer behavioral and discipline reports. The next theme was around students and families. Students express wanting to be at school more often than before and are glad to be in person when they can. Students learning how to advocate for themselves in a new environment. There's more personalized time due to Zooming. There's increased contact with family. Students are spending more time outside and families are capitalizing on family outdoor activities. Students getting to spend more quality time with family members or have new responsibilities and are rising to that challenge. Students are exploring hobbies and passions they would not have while in school because they have more time and energy and they're actually bored. Ability to build closer one-on-one -on -one relationships with students and students are getting more one-on-one -on -one support. The expansion of mail delivery, uh, delivery programs and free breakfast and lunch for all students. Everybody has been cooperative with COVID requirements and we've all mastered wearing masks. The next piece is virtual meetings. Individual educational plan meetings and other meetings are sometimes easier to organize virtually. Meetings with parents virtually are more streamlined. We've saved travel reimbursements. There's more time in the day to actually get other things done for not having to travel. And this helps with childcare and also telehealth, mental health options are a plus. Overall, COVID has forced us to think about how we deliver services to students and families. At Washington Central Unified Union, which is where I work, uh, we are very lucky in the system that we designed because our students pre-K through eight are in school every single day. Um, at the high school, our students are in school one week and then remote the next based on pods. We potted all of our students and we intentionally potted all of our teachers so that we can reduce cross-contamination. We feel very blessed as we have much more in-person time with our students than some other schools. Uh, and thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Um, so next, and this is the, you're doing the cleanup, I believe. Patty. I think I am. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, thank you for allowing us to uh, join this afternoon. It's also really comforting for me to see some of the faces of some of the reps that I've, I've, uh, I've known and worked with. So it's a pleasure to see some of your faces again. 
In this final part of the testimony or feedback, as I would like to call it, focuses on the direct challenges school counselors are experiencing and will end with how you, the legislature, can help and support our work. We heard from Vermont counselors across the state regarding these challenges, and we'd like to highlight the similar themes that we have gathered. While we do, want, do not want to ignore the other equally important comments, we know that we're not able to read all of them to you during this period. Here are their words. As school counselors, we are worried. We are worried about the kids we can't reach. We're worried about the kids we do reach. We are worried about the kids who are not attending school at all and whose families have shut off all means of communication from the schools. We are working increasingly long hours, adapting as best as possible like while coping with our own individual versions of the pandemic. It is hard not to see facial expressions. During remote learning, some students do, want, do not want to meet because their families cannot provide privacy. There's a disruption in routines, non-confidential settings. There's a lack of access to students because they cannot or will not engage as consistently online or have trouble accessing online meetings. Attendance issues have increased and there's COVID fatigue amongst students and teachers. Connecting with students and families virtually has been very difficult for many families who are struggling financially or health-wise. It is harder to connect with students and to help them with their transition from eighth to ninth and from 12th to college. We are watching our staff struggle and try and make it through the day while challenging students to learn and to stay on track. Counselors are watching the mental health resources become less and less, and counselors are struggling to put programming together to support students when they are in survival mode. There's an increase of 504 requests, loss of ability to offer in-person groups and seminars, Having to spend more time with students with higher needs is causing less time with other students. There's spatial challenges. Student truancy has tripled. Staff needed, staff needs significant support with their own social and emotional well-being. Parents are not allowed to meet in person. The mask and social distancing inhibits a deeper level of communication trying to establish a connection virtually is challenging. Financial insecurities as a whole within the community, budget and position cuts in a time of crisis that directly will impact support for our students. There's unrealistic expectations, inability to deliver same pre-COVID services to students and parents, limited external resources, Many outside therapists are not taking new clients due to capacity limits. Concerns students are facing in terms of abuse and or neglect at home with less access to supports. Hard to believe, but we have some schools in Vermont that don't have school counselors. And yet on the flip side, we have school counselors that have very high caseloads. And it's not even just about the caseload level but about allocated resources in what roles and responsibilities that are assigned to school counselors. Schools that have better funding have more counselors and do not have to oversee other non-school counseling tasks. So the next question we asked was how can the legislature help? Again, this is their words. We would like our role to be understood by the Vermont Agency of Education, the Vermont Principal Association, the Vermont Superintendent Association, so that everyone sees us as mental health providers, our training and our expertise. We would like support from the state regarding a vaccine rollout so that we can increase our direct face-to-face -face support for our students and families. We would like a consistent approach for school counselors to receive the vaccination. Some school districts this week have already approved their school counselors to receive the vaccination, while other school counselors who've learned about it and have reached out to their schools were denied. 
We would like funding for broadband access and cell service for all Vermont students. This will provide the flexibility to continue their learning. We would like funding for all schools to be able to offer summer school credit recovery programs. We would like to support our teachers to have vaccine priority so that we can all work together safely and open up our school for in-person five days per week of instruction. We thank you for your time and allowing us to share our feedback, our hopes and dreams for our Vermont students and families. Our priority is that every Vermont school will employ professional school counselors who are available to assist all students in successfully navigating their academic experiences, assisting them in making informed decisions concerning their career paths, and understanding and managing their social and emotional development. All of us here right now together, we can all make a positive impact during this difficult time in our country. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm gonna open it up to questions from the committee members and I see Representative Hooper. Thank you all for your testimony. Um, it's, it's heavy stuff. Um, I wanted to ask Patricia about, uh, excuse me, uh, Phyllis about uh, something she said. She said, we need to switch some things around. Um, I just kind of was wondering if you might expand on some of that rearrangement that you hoped for. Well, I think some of what Patricia was alluding to, um, sometimes we're tasked with duties that aren't necessarily school counselor related. This impedes on our ability to actually get the work done in the mental health arena for our students and our communities. So I'll give you an example. This year I have to, um, I have 150 minutes with a class. So that only then leaves me 80 minutes after my contracted day of actual counseling time. Um, and that's because the duties, there's been so many additional duties added to our plate. Um, and it's always been like that, like with when PLPs came around and proficiencies came around, it was always kind of given to the school counselor because most of us have in our contract other duties as warranted. So it, that, that programming, although well-meaning and fantastic for our students, can take away from our ability to counsel our students. Um, so when I, when I, I think we need some, we need central to like our central, our superintendent, our principals to say, no, that's not a duty for Phyllis. Phyllis needs to focus on the well being of our students. She shouldn't necessarily um, be the AP coordinator or the PSAT coordinator or, uh, you know, just programming that takes away from direct and indirect services for our students. So you're Phyllis. basically being asked um, to, to not do your job, to do a different job. Correct. Okay, I understand. And uh, just, Madam Chair, may I uh, ask Patricia something? Yes, yes ma'am. Um, I, I was curious to know uh, how we, the Education Committee on the House side, can help uh, the legislature help you with the summer school credit recovery aspect of things. That, that sounds very interesting and, and essential to me. Um, I'll certainly have another one of uh, Councilor speak up, uh, Rye Hoffman, but I, I are, are under what we're trying to get is funding for that. What we do know is that we have plenty of students that are that even after this first semester that need recovery. They haven't completed their courses and they need extra help. We're anticipating that that's not going to change. It's going to filter into the second semester and then we'll filter toward the end of the school year and they're not ready. We want to make sure that they have a good, strong start at the, at the start of the next school year. We do know that uh, there, the school districts are going to have available over $100 million um, of federal funds. Uh, we are going to be looking at that next week. Um, there's the, uh, I think that will be of interest to see how some of these funds can be used to address the issues that you are talking about and the other members of the education community have been referring to. Um, Representative James and then Representative, then Representative Brady. Um, thanks Chair Webb and thanks uh, to all of you for being here. I think Rye, um, you were talking a little bit about um, what you're seeing as a decline in um, college interest 
And I wondered if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Do you think students are um, thinking of deferring a year in the hopes that a normal college experience will be available to them down the road? Or do you think students are losing interest in attending, period? And just wave at me and I'll, I'll call on you. <laughs> Deborah, let's take that one. So, um, right. yes, Rai Hoffman. Um, and thank you, represent, Representative James. Um, from my perspective, and the students that we have here at Spalding High School, we had a number of students last year that deferred um, because they were, you know, they were aware that their experience was going to be a virtual experience. And, you know, for the, the cost of education at the secondary level, they, they didn't feel like it was, um, quote unquote, worth it. Um, we've had some students that went for a semester and they've come back and are, are choosing not to return. Um, and, and they talk to our current students and, and what their experience has been. Um, now our current seniors are, are considering different options um, going into the course, you know, again, get back to normal um, until such time as they can have a, a true college experience. Our hope is that they will actually do that um, and, but we also know that, you know, continuing with education right from the end of senior year right into a college program tends to be a bit more successful and sustainable than, than sometimes taking a, you know, a gap year um, or taking a year off or two, so. Thank you. Representative Brady. And then Representative Godwin. <clears throat> uh, thanks so much for everybody being here today and, and sharing things that I think we're all um, experiencing in the schools and just our overwhelming concern for kids and particularly for kids who are um, struggle in normal times. And so this is only exacerbating everything. Um, I don't necessarily have a question for the witnesses here today, but more a note for us as the committee. I think when we work with the AOE or hear from them in terms of like the, the state recovery and re-engagement plan I'm thinking more about this um, uh, students who don't pass courses and credits. Um, and on the one hand, I don't want to necessarily volunteer that the state should be dictating how schools should be teaching courses or what, but I'm, I'm huge red flags are going up for me here about an equity issue um, of if, if it's done very locally, um, you know, who, what kids really have to make up what credits to advance to what grade to graduate. Uh, you know, I think that's messy in any normal time, <laughs> um, but this is just so exacerbated and uh, families and parents that have, you know, access to maybe advocate um, versus students who don't, uh, you know, the, the last thing we want is fewer kids graduating because they lived through this. Um, and I, I, I just almost, I'm here feeling like we need some sort of statewide amnesty or something, or, or we're, we're setting up um, struggling kids for real disaster. <laughs> so more, more of a comment and thoughts for us as a committee as we talk with AOE and, and the, that plan. Thank you, I think that's a good point. Um, Representative Conlon and then Williams. Thanks, uh, same exact topic. Um, and I guess I'll direct my question to Rai because you, you brought it up. And, I, and I'd, I'd like your thoughts on, you know, how should the state or schools handle the, probably, the, as you said, you have a, a tripling in the number of kids who are failing classes. We heard yesterday from a lot of educators who said, what we got to be careful not to do is to punish the kids. Um, and so how, how would you suggest we sort of balance um, a, flunked, a, a flunked class, not, not punishing kids and recognizing this crazy time we're in. Yeah, it's a really, it's a great question, Representative, Representative Conlon, and one that's really difficult to, to answer, quite honestly. I mean, different districts are, are handling the educational protocols differently, I would say. Um, so I can speak to our experience at, at Spalding High School, where we have a, you know, a significantly high number of students that are most likely not going to be successful in their first semester classes. Um, and, and where, where that, that summer programming could be of help. And, and quite honestly, it's, it's a bit of a Band-Aid, but it's a better Band-Aid than what we currently have at our disposal. Um, you know, and as it relates to the social-emotional needs of our students, 
if students aren't feeling successful in their education um, and they're, if they're frustrated, they're you know, more apt to give up um, and to stop trying. And we want to be able to provide them hope and um, an opportunity to, to continue their learning. Um, as we've moved towards proficiencies, there's certain standards that need to be met to meet graduation requirements. And, and during normal times, sometimes that can be challenging. During these times, it's really challenging for a lot of kids. Um, and as Representative Brady spoke to, equity is, is a huge factor in that. You know, some students that have more um, than others are at a greater advantage right now than, than those who, who have less. And um, it's a challenge that keeps us educators up at night, quite honestly. Um, so any assistance that, that this a House Education Committee can give to, uh, to sort of balance those challenges would be um, greatly appreciated for us and for our students. Thanks. I'm sure it's not a not an easy topic. I, I, if I didn't know if somebody else wanted to jump in, I had one more follow-up question, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I would like to say something, if I could. I'd like to see that there's some recovery work or, or, or uh, during the school day. I agree with you, there's that fine balance between what we're calling punishing and not, and yet if students don't get that basic foundational knowledge, it's very difficult to get to that next level. I'd like to see something that's embedded within the school day with supports that are available for students that have an academic study or study hall where they can get some of that support. I think it's time for us to start looking outside of the box of the traditional school day that is over by three. Is there something we can offer at, at, at different times of the day? I know that creates another, you know, probably another financial burden. However, we need to start thinking differently and looking at school differently. Um, is there an opportunity during school breaks? There's an opportunity in the summers where students can, you know, really have what we call in the state of Vermont, a truly flexible learning opportunity and a pathway. I think the time is right to start thinking about that. And if, and if I could add, I also, there's also been a number of articles that have been out in regards to, are the students really falling behind? Right, all of this is a social construct that's been put in place long before I was born. Um, and so I think we have to think about our language and how we say things and what the world in the future looks like and what students actually need to be successful. So I unfortunately take it right, right a different approach in regards to um, are they for me they're not really behind many of them may actually be ahead because they learn new skills and they've learned different ways to compensate um, and have learned different ways to help themselves so maybe they're not they're behind in the in the the prior social construct maybe we need a new social construct or no social construct and just a different way to go thank you Anna. so also the oh sorry go ahead no, go ahead that's fine um, I've been doing some research on that as well, and I've been reading about the COVID slide because we have, um, we went to semesters blocks here. So now we have students who haven't been engaging in math or literacy since last March. So now they have seven months of not engaging in that skill. So my fear is, as Lisa was saying, that that social construct of now we have to take assessments three times a year. We just finished our maps assessment this week. I, our kids are going to be scoring low and where does that fit in with our funding and what our design of our day will look like now, um, as well as when we have to take the SBACs, if we do have to take the SBACs in the spring, I mean, it's clear that most of our kids here will probably not be that successful with having that much math and reading um, gone for, for the past few months. And I do believe in the COVID slide. I think there's a summer slide and I do think there is a COVID slide in what we now currently have in our education system. And my fear as we keep moving forward, my fear with my ninth graders is that they're not getting a true ninth grade transition this year. They, and how will that look four years from now when and if the college and the universities and their bosses from different local businesses expect a certain level of an SAT score or of a, um, of a state test to get into the court system or whatever it might be. My fear is that they're not getting learning in the way that um, might be what we're used to. So it is a concern as we move forward. It's not just a nine month COVID concern. It's going to be from our current K-12 for the next four years, I think. Talking about a generation of, of learners. Thank you very much. Across the world. Um, 
Representative Conlon. I'm done. Thank you very much. You're done. Okay. Um, Representative Brady, did you have another one? Oh, and, oh, excuse me, Representative Williams, I didn't get to you. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, in reference to the summer schooling, I think it's a great idea, at least um, in the immediate thought. I think um, thinking outside of the box always excites me. Um, I, I hear so many of you saying you're burning out. If we came up with the money, do we have the instructors to fill the void that is needed for the summer schools? That would be my concern. Anybody have that? <laughs> we certainly are hearing that there may be an exodus of our you know, 60 plus crowd that is now saying, I think it's time. Um, well, I can speak to, again, my, my community and my school. Um, we have years ago offered a summer school program. Um, we have lost that funding over the last couple of years. And so, and it's not, um, again, to Representative Brady's comments, um, it is, it's not a fix for everybody. Um, and, and it won't be, a, it, not everybody can access that, both by choice um, or, um, or just their own, you know, what they have planned for the summer. So um, it could just, what I would like to see is that all schools have that ability to offer such a program if they can, um, and that the funds that could do so could, could allow that to happen. Um, at our school, we do have the staffing. Um, I have done the research <laughs> to check and see that we have the staffing to be able to offer it. Right now, we don't have the funds. Um, and Flexibility is a great word. <laughs> I think that was my point. So my point wasn't necessarily like, let's have them do summer because I've looked at your comments here. My point was not so much about that as it was merely suggesting a flexible schedule. In some states are looking at what they're calling a flexible year round schedule where maybe for some, they might may want to go to school in the summer and have winter off. It was again, just a way of looking broadly and not just thinking about what do we have and what's considered punitive and what that. It's to really take the time now to think about what could be a more flexible way of educating our children and giving them what they need as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Brady, oh, excuse me, Representative Brown. Oh, sure. I just had a thank you, Chair Webb. I just had a really quick follow up to our discussion about summer. Um, assuming that staffing and funding, you know, did come through for these summer programs, what is the, I mean, what is the planning phase for that? I know we're here in January, but I feel like setting up summer programs happens many months in advance. So is there a critical window that schools are sort of on a deadline for? Well, again, I can, I, I'll try to speak to that from our perspective or Spalding's perspective. Um, again, we're ending our first semester now. Um, I am currently in the, the midst of rescheduling our second semester classes to try and um, make sure that students that need to retake classes can do so. Um, and quite honestly, won't have the capacity to do so. We don't have the, the number of teachers um, or the amount of space in order to, to fully pull it off. And so being able to have an answer to parents and students that we will have a summer program and summer options to continue that work at that time um, would be a much easier conversation for me to have than, than to not have that answer. So although it's an unfair answer to your question, the sooner the better. <laughs> And having pulled summer school together uh, very quickly, um, right? April, May would is still a is still a very doable time frame, right? Um, I know many of us this summer redid our entire master schedules in like three weeks. Um, so if you were to tell us mid May that we had funds, we would very quickly figure out what we would be offering and get those signups and get that in place. So we have seen school districts pull together remote learning under ridiculously impossible circumstances. I, if anybody could figure this out, it would be some teachers. 
um, if you indeed have the support from administration. And that will be a discussion we will be having. Um, Representative Hooper, do you have, still have a question or you're done? Oh, um, I didn't realize my hand was still up. And um, Representative Williams, I still see your hand. Are you still okay? Kate, could I just jump in with a quick question? If nobody sure, and then Representative Arson. Sure, go ahead. It's a very quick one. Uh, it's for Suzanne from Union Elementary, my alma mater. Um, <laughs> you talked about a survey that you had done in November, and I was unclear whether that was November, just this past November or the previous November, because you said that you saw a big increase mm. once COVID started. Yeah, so we we conducted the screener in the spring in in May of last year, and then again in November of this year. Okay, all right. Thank so you. That clears it up. It's it's comparing apples to oranges, really, though, because we yes. were fully remote back then. So we'll do it again next April, this coming April, um, and we'll have that as a better comparison for Thank where you. students are at. Thank you. Representative Arison? Yeah, um, I'm not sure any of the today's panelists can answer this, but um, in my own mind, I'd like some kind of handle on where Vermont stands in, in relation to the rest of the country. And where I'm going with that is that a common thread we've heard all week is staffing. And I don't think there's people in the pipeline to fill the staffing issues. And another issue, of course, is that Vermont has never been known as the place you want to go to because the pay is so high. So um, anyway, I'm just curious on where we stand in compared to the rest of the country, because I'm sure our situation isn't unique. I think we can answer in regards to um, school counselors and school counselor um, candidates. Um, I can tell you today I received three uh, emails with applications for interns for next year, um, right? With UVM having a school counseling program, um, we ha do have a strong pool of applicants for school counselors. There will be many more counselors who graduate um, than counselor openings. So if there was funding to increase the school counseling population, I do believe we would have the candidates to fill those. I think and, your, and your question what, about in terms of school counselors, we can speak to the Vermont ratio. Vermont ratio is low compared to other states. However, in Vermont, what's, what's unique about it is that while numbers may look low for some schools, they're assigned a lot of different responsibilities in some of our more wealthier school districts. Uh, so they numbers may look low in terms of that, like I said that caseload, but it's very different in terms of the actual uh, additional non-counseling responsibilities. And I just wanted to add that uh, I also uh, teach in the, the counseling program at NVU Johnson, the school counselor um, program there. And I've been encouraged by the number of students who are enrolling in that program and, and graduating and are ready to be school counselors here in Vermont. Uh, and um, I also wanted to say in terms of the ratios, you know, Montpelier is a great example of how it's kind of out of whack because in my school in a normal year, we would have more than 400 students and I'm the only school counselor. We have a social worker full time, but you know, and what happens in a lot of our districts is is we might have a school counselor, but they're only there two days a week, especially at the elementary level. That's what happens. And you know, I just want to advocate for our youngest kids because it's really important that we give them the foundation so that they when they get to Patty and Phyllis and Lisa and Rye, they're prepared and ready and have coping skills and high self-esteem. So. Thank you, Representative Coopley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have heard no mention of technical school students. Are you, how is the counseling going with them? How are they performing? Are they doing any differently than the traditional student? I can speak on that um, both personally because my son goes to a tech school as well as my, some of my students. 
Um, the tech, I think the tech schools are doing the best they could. I definitely think that they, you know, they love their hands-on students, but it's my students that choose as well as my son that choose to go to the tech schools are doing it because they want the hands-on experience and COVID has put a damper on that um, where you're not getting the same hands-on experiences as in years past. Um, I've had a few students drop out of the tech school and come back to the home school because it wasn't that same experience. And our local tech school is red day, white day. So they're home. They're only, they only go to school two days a week or three days a week. Um, and that, so that hasn't um, helped much with, with their style of learning. Um, so I don't think it's great. I think they're suffering too. And they're another group that they use a lot of funding from the Perkin, Perkins Fund and they can't use it right now because we can't, we can't get to some of the things that we would use our funding for. Thank you. I think, it, I think it's very um, location specific. Um, in central Vermont, our career center is open um, four days a week. Um, and they definitely, they were remote for a little while between Thanksgiving and, and the new year. Um, but when they are, when they are able to be in the building, they are luckily, luckily, luckily enough to be in the building, like I said, four days a week. Um, and when they were remote, uh, they were actually mailing them. I was talking to some of my students who are in the Cosmo program and asking her, so how is that working remotely? And she said, they mailed us our mannequins and all of our nail stuff. Stuff and right and so we're zooming, but we're actually still doing the hands-on stuff. It's just from home, so it's it's not fabulous, nor is any of this. But they are definitely doing the best that they can do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've very much appreciated hearing from you. I, I greatly appreciate you reaching out to me, Phyllis, um, particularly given current circumstances in our schools. I think we're hearing you loud and clear, the value of keeping schools open. I think we're hearing loud and clear that we have some students that are, are seriously struggling with mental health issues. And I think we're hearing your call for broadband and funding and vaccines and um, remembering that we have an underlying condition that's gonna be making uh, academic learning a challenge if we don't address some of the underlying mental health and social issues of our children as well as nutritional um we have work to do thank yeah. you so much for yeah. taking the time to hear us and appreciate um all that we have to say and all that we do for our students we really appreciate your time and you know our goal is to make sure that the mental health doesn't get lost in the learning process because as most people know if you're not feeling good you're not learning well so we really want it, you know, when we think about summer funding, I'm really hoping that also includes mental health funding for our students. Um, I would gladly work more days over the summer and counsel my students more one-on-one -on -one if, you know, if the funding is there. So um, we're willing to do the work. We'll, whatever you guys think um, you could throw at us, we, we're willing to do it. And, you know, we believe that we, we're working as a team now for our, our younger generations. I, I thank you so much for the work you do. I mean, you right now, you guys are the heroes in this story. And um, we will be looking at, at what our, our role will be. We're gonna be looking at what the 127 million that's going, we now are learning is going directly to schools, it's not going through us. So we're not gonna have some of the controls I certainly wanted. <laughs> um, but uh, we, will, we will be seeing what, what it is that we can do to help direct um, towards uh, our, our generation of learners that, that are growing in the period of COVID. We know they're all learning, it's just what are they learning? <laughs> um, thank you all so much. And with that, I think that we are done. We are finished. Um, I will be going over the, the uh, schedule with, with um, Jesse for next week. I expect to be able to have that posted. I don't know. It'll be posted on Monday, probably. I don't think we can get it posted today. Um, but we'll, we'll get it posted on Monday and we'll let you know what we're doing. Um, my email is available. I work all the time, <laughs> just like teachers. I work all the time. 
and um, I'm more than happy to, to hear from you as we're going forward. I've, right. got, I've got some thoughts. Kate, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, thank Peter. You, folks. Um, it's just a, a, a question. Um, in terms of next week and, and you know wanting to hear about learning loss and learning recovery. Yeah. Uh, and then you you've talked about the DMG report. Yeah. Uh, and, so they, and I'm just uh, I, I get confused as to whether you know yeah. it, and maybe they're all blended together, but where DMG falls in recovery versus 173, or is 173 being talked about in terms of recovery as well? And yeah, I just want to yeah. get a little more um, understanding I'm of that. I'm almost trying to think if we can just do a, you know, COVID-related <laughs> emergency bill <laughs> to address some of the issues folks are talking about while we're also looking at um, 173 and. Um, well, and I guess maybe like my question, I'm trying to be too categorical. Yeah. So, so like if we get Nate Levinson in to talk about the DMG report next week, is that under the under the umbrella of recovery or is that under the umbrella of 173? I think it's both because okay. I think that I think that that report sets out um, how you look at MTSS, how you get those services into the tier one that which is general education, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier tier. Two is additional support and tier three is special ed. For the most part, I think that's still what it is, Aaron, correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, that if we're hearing, we're hearing multi-tiered systems of support. We're hearing that some are skilled. We're hearing that some are not. Um, and I, I, I think that's why I'm, I'm thinking that having the background of what the, the DMG report recommended um, and, and if we can start to get some of that implemented, what to, you know, Sarita will be introducing her bill, which will be COVID related and looking at the literacy work that we did last year. Great, great. So, I, that, I, I agree with that very much, yeah. yeah. Um, just one more thing. I uh, just want to compliment our new members on their questioning. Mm -hmm. uh, when you ask a question, you guys are focused. You ask a, a good direct question um, and it's been very productive. Yes. And I like Aaron. I like Aaron's idea of being able to just give everybody amnesty for all the students' amnesty for next year. <laughs> I did. I did go to a. I think it was an NCSL thing on assessment um, over the summer, um, and I'm just trying to find my notes on what we do with that. We could all do very well with the uh, newly 18-year-old voters if we can just. <laughs> call, it, call it amnesty on their credits now. You can just start. <laughs> Um, okay, everybody, uh, I so appreciate you. I think we've got a really super committee. Um, I'm excited of, uh, to get to work here. So I think we've got another week of sort of building and then I think we're gonna start talking about um, working on, on some bills. And I am gonna try to find some time to have some of those bills presented to us, even if it's just, here's the bill, here's what we're looking for, and then we'll talk about it later. Um, I, I may do that, just have a, a day where just come on in the committee and tell us about your bill. Um, but the, the waiting study bill uh, will be uh, will be connected um, because it did come out of Act 173. All right. Okay. Everybody. Thank you.